right. Welcome to Ireland. Welcome to Ireland. Yeah, how about that? Um, my name is David Timoney. I'm the chair of education at Delaware Valley University in lovely Doylestown, Pennsylvania, just about an hour north of the city where I live with my family in West Philadelphia, which is about a 10 minute walk from places like UPenn and a number of the parks there in West Philly. So uh, I bring you greetings from many wonderful places. Um, I, I wanted to talk with you today uh, about a methodology that I've been developing over several years uh, on the kind of the authentic methodology for the demonstration of expertise as as is my title. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, go too deep into it because like, we do have just about 10 minutes with some time for discussion and also uh, it'll be in the paper so you'll be able to read that a little more in depth than I'm always available uh, to chat. So first of all, you know, what is expertise? I mean, I think that we colloquially use the term expertise and um, a lowercase e, as I like to say, um, but uppercase e expertise, we're talking about superlative skills. We're talking, you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll discuss expertise with folks and, you know, teachers, I have to admit, I'm a K-12 guy originally, and teachers are notorious. You start talking about expertise, and after a while they get upset because they think you're going to talk about them. Um, but actually, you're going to talk about folks who are a little deeper, a little more narrow, um, but not quite uh, their, their uh, walking definition of expertise. We're not talking about the, the top 5%. We're not even talking about the top 2%. We're talking about that 1% or less in, in a various number of uh, very discrete domains. Um, and when we start to look at this, I dove into expertise way back in grad school initially in in the realm of critique because i couldn't figure out any way in the world for expertise theory and its tenets to be applicable to the classroom and if a if a theory for me is going to work if a theory around learning is going to work it's also got to go the other way and be a theory for teaching and beyond the one-on-one -on -one or very very small group setting it couldn't seem to work so i dove into really really tearing it apart and what I came away with was a real love for um, what goes into the development of superlative skill. But my question that remains is how do we make that meaningful? Because so often the discussion and the measurement and description of expertise leaves the folks who are the recipients of that expertise without a voice. Um, and my first exploration, which I'll use uh, as an example a bit later, was into teacher expertise. You know, and the question is, you know, do we need to identify and evaluate and manage expertise in that way? Is it valuable to us? And to whom is expertise most meaningful? So currently I'm working on a, a couple of different areas of expertise um, uh, exploration. The, the first and, and the one that's closest to me, as I've already mentioned, is teacher expertise, how that affects the classroom. I'm also working in, I'm in the middle of a study of expertise in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, which is really uh, fun for me because I'm also a practitioner of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So it's nice to observe and to meet folks who do that type of uh, martial art. But it also has a very clearly delineated belt system and uh, procedures for elevating your skill and moving through the ranks to, to increase your skill. That all being said, you ask any Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt if they're an expert and they're very quick to say that they're not and give you a list of 10 or 20 people who are far better than they are. Um, it is rare that you'll find that level of humility among folks who are kind of regarded and ranked so highly. The other is a, a little bit of a sideways uh, dive into expertise. And that is the work that I'm doing with law enforcement, first responders and military in regard to memory performance and execution in what we what we jokingly refer to as suboptimal conditions um, and what we really mean is we mean high stress areas um, where the folks who are participating in that are are in a panicked state um, and they've lost sense of many of, of many of their faculties and most of their training um, so that's a that's a fun little thing that i'm doing with a, a training partner out in um, out in pasadena and we're working on some things uh, some projects there but 
one of the challenges that we get to in expertise is first the identification of expertise, right? The, the, the exploration into whether an area is worth determining expertise, right? Um, I, I jokingly referred one time, I said, well, you can't really be an expert in say walking. And of course, as soon as it came out of my mouth, somebody said, well, actually, actually you can. There are people who are professional and sport walkers. So you probably could determine a, an area of expertise for walking. So I don't really have an example of what would not be an area of expertise because I don't want to be called out again in a public forum. Um, but I will say that it's important for us to, to, to look at when we identify an area to say, are there ways that we can determine whether there is an interest in this area for expertise? Is it valuable to us to say, here's an area where we can set up some parameters around what is um, kind of novice skill, that is to say fully trained but not experienced, um, an experienced non-expert and an expert, if we break it down into three uh, levels uh, for expertise. And what's the value in that? What does it give us to know, to be able to identify and to differentiate between the novice, the experienced, and the expert? Um, the second area that we look at is the definition, right? And for my methodology, this is what's key. There are many areas, uh, the first of which was chess, right? Remember the first AI, if you're my age or older, you remember computerized chess when it came out. And that was, you know, can you beat the computer? Um, and the answer to that remains no, if you keep the computer set high enough. But when, when expertise came about, it was, it was rooted in this AI research and the first AI being the, the chess computers. Um, and nowadays, we have these very intricate methods by which to measure things like expanded working memory, right? We can, we can plop somebody into a functional MRI machine and see that there has been some geographic changes in the way their brain functions, right? The same way almost that, um, that muscle tissue becomes more efficient, thus needing less muscle tissue to function. Um, the brain becomes very, very efficient. And that becomes a marker for expertise, but it's gone in some cases so far out that we, that we kind of put the cart before the horse and we can't necessarily connect the level of expertise with those changes that occur either in the physiology or in the operations of the brain and connected to the, the high level of skill. Um, something that I, that I noticed very early on is that if you take two, let's say international grandmasters in chess, two of the greatest chess players alive, you sit them in a room and guess what? One of them's gonna lose. And that is, you know, that's just the way it happens, right? But for the observer, there's an effect on the observer. There's something that happens when you see someone who is supposed to be really great at something fail, right? We watch boxing matches on TV or UFC or whatever it might be. And in, in most cases, these are two of the greatest of their time, you know, in that tiny little scope of a uh, window of time, but one of them is going to lose. And seeing that changes our perception, right? So what I do with my methodology is that I go and I gather not just data around achievement, not just arbitrary data, right? What I found with, with teacher expertise data is they had, they had markers like experienced, has had a student teacher. And he said, well, you know, if you stick around long enough, right? Is that the Peter principle? You stick around long enough and you kind of rise. And that's not how expertise happens. That's not how expertise occurs. Rather, I went to the students and I asked them. I went to their peers. I went to the people who were daily, day to day interacting with their expertise and asked them what they do. Um, you know, it's important for us to gather from the folks around us, the recipients, the beneficiaries of that, um, their peers, ancillary dependents, right? This week, my wife has been in a virtual conference with, uh, with cardiac surgeons. And you hear them talk and you think there are so many people in the room who are dependent upon the expertise of these surgeons, right? The anesthetists, the nurses, other surgeons, people who did the prep work, people who do the cleanup work, the families, the patients themselves, the people doing the follow-up work. Ask those folks whose surgeons they prefer when they come out of that room. And you'll start to see, regardless of what regard they're held in prior to the surgery, 
you'll see what the cleanup looks like. You'll see who, oh, I prefer a patient from this surgeon for this reason. And these are important for us. And when we look at expertise, I think it's critical for us as well. I think it's important for us to look at the mentors to get there. I mean, you, we all know as a student or as a peer or as a mentor that we can set aside how famous someone is uh, in our context. And we could say, you know what? This person's really helpful to me. This person has advanced my career and in a way that these other individuals have not, despite their place and time. Finally, we get to the measurement, right? The internal and the external. Um, in and out of context, what does this look like? Um, you know, you have a, a, a chess player who hardly ever wins, and you think, well, how do they get their ratings so high if they keep losing? But they're there. They're always in the fight. You know, the, the, the basketball team that somehow manages to always get in the playoffs, right? I'm, I'm from Philly, right? So we got a lot of those teams that always manage to get into the playoffs, um, but never quite seal the deal as often as we'd like. What does it look like in practice? And what are those, what are those features? What does expertise look like? And ultimately, what are the benefits of the expertise? Where does it come from? How do we benefit from it? Right. So when I sat down with some students um, from from some high schools in Philadelphia, I asked them, I said, you know, what does um, well, that slides a little goofy, so I'll talk through it. Um, I said, what does the expert teacher do? Right. And they started listing some things. I said, oh, they, oh, I have an expert teacher. And they started giving me some features of these expert teachers. Some of them were pretty obvious. Some of them were outrageously insightful. Right. They said things like. I know a teacher is an expert when they're when they don't have to go to the textbook for everything and you think to yourself well it's like well i think i'm an expert too but i go to the textbook sometimes so maybe they don't think i'm an expert and that hurts but then they'll say things like i can tell a teacher is not an expert when i get the sense that they need to be my friend in order to feel good about teaching and for like for a 15 year old kid that's deep that's really deep. And you know what else? It's not just deep. Almost everything these students said to me was dead in line with the literature about teacher competence and teacher expertise. But when I went to talk to administrators and I went to talk to other adult teachers, their answers were vague and didn't really match the literature. Kind of boilerplate responses, someone who's got their advanced degree, someone who's been doing the job for a long time, they make their deadlines, they don't cause any trouble. But students, I mean, it's typical of adolescents to be a little more black and white. But in regard to teacher novice behaviors and teacher expertise behaviors, it was the students who were more accurate and more clear in their descriptions, not the administrators. And I thought to myself, I should start asking with a profile of a novice and a profile of a of an expert teacher, I should rather start asking them, who would you rather work with? Or who would you rather hire? Ra instead of, what do you think this behavior looks like? Which brings us back to authenticity. It brings us back to the idea of in reality, does it matter if I'm deemed an expert, if you get no benefit from my expertise? If my expertise has not improved your scholarship, your life, your whatever it is that I'm supposed to do with you. Um, many, many years ago, I had surgery on my ear and my insurance company didn't want to pay for it. So I had to appeal and I had to appeal and I had to appeal uh, four times, I think. And the final time was a, was like a hearing with a jury of peers. And I got the surgeon that I wanted who was out of network to come on the call. And we all know insurance companies only really care about money. And he hit this, what I'm guessing was a very rehearsed line, but it ended everything. He said, what matters is the outcomes after the surgery. And my patients have better outcomes after the surgery. They're less likely to come back into the hospital and fix a mistake. They're more likely to recover quickly and to not need any more help. David, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have only about uh, two more minutes. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very simple for them to approve that because they were looking at what? They were looking at the outcomes based on his expertise above all things, which of course saved them a bunch of money. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing now. If there's any questions or anything we could talk about, and I'm always happy if there's more time at the end, that may be a better time to do so.